Mitchell is a data scientist. She's currently at Solar Analytics, where her primary focus is helping homeowners make the best use of their solar energy. Um, she has some few fun side projects going on, including creating Twitter bots, crocheting space shuttles, and Napoleonic reenactment. Um, she's also an organizer for Sydney Python and Sydney Pie Ladies, and enthusiastic member of the Girl Geek Sydney community. So please welcome Rachel. I might have had a bit too much fun making this opening slide, but the title <laughs> seemed to need it. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking about hyperbolic crochet coral reefs. So I kind of, I think some people would recognize most of these words, maybe not all of them, and probably not in this combination. So I'm going to go through and explain what each of these things are. So to start off with, hyperbolic. So 2,300 years ago, there was a mathematician called Euclid. And what you need to know about mathematicians is that, is that they like proving things. Um, but some things are just really obvious and can't be proved. And these are called axioms. And axioms, well, they should be obvious. So we're talking about things like if you have two points, you can draw a line in between them. Is that obvious enough to everyone? Um, another one is that all right angles are the same everywhere. So no matter the orientation or the size of the lines, they're all 90 degrees. So this, this guy, that's Euclid. He also made a fifth axiom that caused some problems. So this is the fifth axiom. If a straight line falling on two straight lines make the interior angle on the same side less than two right angles, the two straight lines are produced indefinitely meet on the side which are the angles less than two right angles. So you might have noticed there was a bit of step up in obviousness between these axioms. Um, this is equivalent to saying that if the interior angles, the two red circles, add up to 180 degrees, that these two lines are then parallel. You might remember this as co-interior angles from high school. But mathematicians weren't happy with this at all. It was just not obvious enough. Um, they really wanted to prove this, but they couldn't. And at the same time, they just couldn't discard this um, axiom because it was just too useful. Um, it was used for things like the angle sum of a triangle is 180 degrees. You <coughs> can't prove it otherwise. So fast forward until 1820. So there's a, 2000, a good 2,000 years of mathematicians getting really frustrated over this. And a young Hungarian mathematician named Janos Boyai was becoming really obsessed with this problem. Uh, so obsessed that his father wrote to him saying, for God's sake, I beseech you, give it up. Fear it no less than sensual pleasures, because it too may take all your time, deprive you of your health, peace of mind, and happiness in life. Like, it's very serious stuff. Um, and Janusz ignored his father, and a few years later could write to his father saying, I created a new, different world out of nothing. So what he realized is that this fifth axiom only worked on flat surfaces, um, not on curved surfaces, not on hyperbolic space. We're getting to hyperbolic space still. So to give you a demonstration, we've got a balloon, which is not flat. And remember how I said that a triangle, um, the angle sum of a triangle, you need a fifth axiom to prove it. So we can draw a triangle on this balloon whose angle sum is more than 180 degrees. So Basically, what you're doing, my straight line's not going to be very straight today, but each of the angles I'm drawing are roughly 90 degrees. And you draw it, and then you get a triangle whose angle sum is 270 degrees. But to make things even better, I could say this is the uh, exterior of the angle, the interior of the angle is the rest of the thing. So the angle sum is really whatever 3 times 270 degrees is. Um, I'll pass this around, people. Well, that was a terrible hit. <laughs> oh, well. Um, so what do hyperbolic spaces actually look like? So if you imagine flat space, if we're on one of these squares, we move forward, and a similar amount of squares around the place. It's all nice and sane. But what I've done here, I started on, the, on that side. I added another square on each column. And you can see that it gets close together and very quickly they're overlapping and you can't really see the squares in just two dimensions. They're going to be starting to go up into three dimensions. Um, MC Escher has shown this in some of his prints. So this is uh, circle limit number three. So if you imagine these fissures, 
um, they get progressively smaller as you get to the edges of the circle. But if you imagine them all being the same size, you can kind of start seeing the spaces um, curling up. Um, mathematicians did try and make some paper 3D models of them. So they got strips of paper that were progressively longer and were sticking them together. They weren't very robust models. Um, that's a picture of one of them. So jump forward now to 97. A mathematician named Dana Tamina was teaching a course on hyperbolic geometry and she really wanted a teaching tool that her students could actually touch and play with unlike those paper models. And she's just like, well, it's just really, you have square, like if you think about the squares, I'm just adding more squares. And you're like, well, that's really just knitting. So she started knitting. And so to start knitting, you would start off with like a smallish amount of stitches and then just keep on increasing each row. But the thing with knitting is that all your stitches are on your needle. And when you have all, if you're making more and more stitches, you're going to need really long needles to keep them going. So into crochet. So crochet is different from knitting. <laughs> Um, it's like knitting, as in they both produce fabric using long strings of stuff, normally wool. But knitting uses two needles, crochet uses one hook. Knitting has all the stitches on a needle, and crochet generally only has one active stitch at a time. So you can see in that picture, you'll kind of see in that picture that there's only one stitch active compared to the knitting needles. Um, so it's much easier when you're crocheting to deal with a large amount of stitches because they're just off doing their own thing. And it's also quite good for structural objects. It produces a stiffer fabric, or generally does. And it's the same deal as with the um, knitting. You start with a small amount of stitches and just keep on increasing as you go along. Um, I'm going to start here. So this is Dana with some of her pieces. And you might notice these pieces, they look, look a little bit like a coral reef. So I've got a few pieces in here. I'm going to chuck them around. I'm going to do a better job than last time. Oh, I knock off my microphone in the process. <laughs> um, so I've got lots. So this is a nice big one. If you look at it, you can see there's some stitching on it that is an attempt to show the parallel line postulate doesn't work on here. Um, yeah. Pass it, Chris. So coral reefs. Um, coral reefs cover 0.1% of the ocean floor, but are home to 25% of marine life. Um, they're really sensitive ecosystem, and especially with climate change occurring and the warming of the waters. Uh, two sisters, Margaret Wehem, who's pictured, she's a science communicator, and Christine Wehem, an artist, saw these pieces and they were also like, this looks like coral. So they started a hyperbolic coral reef project. It looks like that. So the project was an intersection of mathematics and marine biology and handicrafts and community art practice. Because they took this worldwide. Um, there was a coral reef in Sydney quite a few years ago now, hosted by the Powerhouse Museum. And it was a big community effort where they got people in who had no idea about any of this stuff but could crochet, making pieces. And they also had people who were just like, oh, this mass thing sounds cool. I'm going to learn to crochet. And all joined together to produce this reef in Sydney. Um, and it being in Australia, hosted in Australia, there was also an emphasis on bleached coral because the uh, Great Barrier Reef is currently being bleached because of pollution and higher temperatures. Uh, there was also a thing about using recycled materials. So this is plastic bags that have been turned into coral reefs. I've got two of these. So I'll chuck these around too. Chris? Oh, hold on. <laughs> Pretty much on time. So what about now? So I've talked about the past a lot here. Um, hyperbolic space is active research. This is Mariam uh, Mizukami, who was the first female Fields Medalist. The Fields Medalist is kind of like the uh, Nobel Prize for mathematicians. So she won it four years ago. She unfortunately died last year from breast cancer. 
Um, but yeah, her research was on hyperbolic geometry, looking at how um, the distances of paths you travel along this uh, hyperbolic space. Uh, the universe is hyperbolic in parts. So if we're doing anything like GPS application, special relativity, you'll need to take into account hyperbolic space. And then closer to home, coral is hyperbolic. If you're looking at um, the surfaces of coral, you need this sort of work, or kale too. I was tempted to buy a bunch of kale and bring it along, but that was, ended up being a bit much. Um, I'm at 10 minutes, which is good because this is my end. <laughs> Couldn't resist some more animations. Well, oh, thank you. Um, fascinating and beautiful. I've done a very small amount of crochet and the trick is always for me keeping track of how many stitches you've done and how many you've gone through and whatnot. So how on earth do you keep track of it when it's, like it's bad enough when it's a square, let alone when you've got to do... The, the great thing is you don't um, because <laughs> the increases, unless you're being pretty fancy and finicky about things, um, you just choose the increase ratio saying every two stitches I'm going to increase. So all you need to do is count to three or four in that case. Um, there's a few cases. I, I had a book with me yesterday that was mathematical needlework. And there's a pattern in there for hyperbolic pants for babies. So you're making a, like, it's, it's actually knitted this one, but you knit, like, knit this hyperbolic shape and you can sort of sew it up in a fancy way and have um, pants for like a one-year-old. It's in a pie shawl knitted. Yeah. yeah a lot of pie shawls. Um, so that, that had very specific ratios. You had to count to 53 or something. And I was mad and made two of them. <laughs> Thank you very much. Rachel. Thank you.